ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. On this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, the election season is already in full swing. What's being said about industry-related issues inside the Beltway? Plus, a historic Angus farm on the eastern shores of Maryland. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Oxner. Thanks for joining us. Topping this week's cattle industry news, several major U.S. agricultural organizations are banding together and working to cowboy up to directly challenge some of the misperceptions consumers have about modern food production. NCBA, the Federation of State Beef Councils, and the Cattlemen's Beef Board, in addition to dozens of other ag industry groups, are joining members of the new U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance. And at the recent Cattle Industry Summer Conference in Florida, key goals of this new alliance were reviewed in detail for beef producers. This is called the United States Farmers and Ranchers Alliance. I was able to be part of the formation of this group. They've got all segments of agriculture and they've all been challenged about how they produce the products that they produce today. And people sometimes raise questions about the, the safety and the validity of how we do that job. And we're all tired of trying to do our own little segment, trying to tell the story of how we produce this. And so we've tried to come together, get kind of a war chest together so that we can go out and tell the consumer how we produce our products and that they're safe. So this is going to be a real benefit to our country and what it does for us. It's uh, the producer putting the right story and the real story back to the consumer. Find out more about the U.S. FRA, the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance, and NCBA role in this important grassroots effort by visiting our website at cattlemantocattlemen.org. While the economy at home may be struggling, American beef exports overseas remain strong. We have more in this week's Market Watch. Market Watch. And joining us in the studio is Dan Hallstrom, Senior Vice President of Marketing and Communication with the Meat Export Federation. Thanks so much for coming to our show. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, I understand the first half of the year export results are in. What are they telling us? Well, the trends we saw earlier in the year are continuing. We're seeing a very good success story. Uh, total global red meat, or I should say beef exports, uh, the first six months were up 25% in terms of volume mm -hmm. and about 40% in terms of value, mm -hmm. uh, almost $2.5 billion. So uh, it's well on pace to shatter last year's record in terms of value anyway. And Dan, you told me that you recently returned from a trip in the Middle East, an uh, exciting market for us as beef producers. Tell us more about what you saw there. Yeah, it, what I saw was it's a land of opportunity uh, in a big way. Now, traditionally, the Middle East, predominantly Egypt, has been a variety of meats market. We're starting to see expansion beyond just Egypt to other countries, uh, UAE, the Emirates, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, some of these other countries, Kuwait, are starting to take more U.S. beef. And uh, the exciting thing about the region is it's not just variety meats, it's also primal cuts. Uh, we saw about 30% of our volume year to date is primal cuts, you know, chucks, rounds, etc., middle meats. So it's fun to see that carcass diversified. That's great. And Central America, I understand you've also been there recently, uh, quite a globetrotter it sounds like, <laughs> but uh, at any rate, you were down there at some sort of showcase that yep. was actually promoting U.S. beef. Can you tell our viewers Correct. about that? Yeah, we held a, what we call a buyer showcase in Panama City. It mm -hmm. was uh, the end of July, and it was an opportunity to bring uh, the seller and buyer together. And uh, it, the funny thing about this uh, story, we started planning it about a year ago, and we we're hoping to get maybe uh, 10 or 15 participants uh, just kind of putting our foot in the water. We ended up with 17 exporters that went down, and we had 41 customers from 11 countries throughout the central and, and the northern part of South America that came. And uh, it's another opportunity. Um, a lot of good uh, economic growth down there, and when you have economic growth, you have demand for better protein. So they're looking at U.S. beef. Well, that's some of the best news I've heard in a long time. So thank you for everything you and the whole team are doing to grow global demand for U.S. beef. We appreciate it. It's our pleasure. Thank you. For more information about U.S. MEF, visit our website at cattlemantocattlemen.org. The 2012 election season is already underway. 
And that has policymakers and voters alike wondering what that means for today's agriculture. We have more in this week's Cattlemen's Capital Concerns. Well, I think it's going to be a clear choice uh, about uh, what you see uh, going forward, whether you're going to have certainty as far as your taxes are concerned, uh, whether you're going to stop this, what I consider to be almost a war on agriculture that is going on with EPA. And, uh, you know, it used to be the USDA was uh, the farmer's advocate. Uh, that role has changed. Uh, they're more supportive of some of the EPA rules and things coming down than they are as far as being advocates for agriculture today. And uh, uh, you're going th this election is going to be about a clear choice, uh, I think, about which direction, whether the government uh, can continues to try and increase their control, uh, either through the EPA or through GIPSA, uh, or, and uh, not have any certainty as far as tax policy. Uh, or people who actually understand production agriculture. I mean, one of the biggest threats to agriculture is the regulations and EPA and how the rules get changed. And, and so we need stability in our federal government. And I think that's what, uh, again, if we could do that, I think farmers and ranchers, that really helps their business. Well, it's every election seems like people say is the most important election ever, but I, I really believe this one is uh, because we, we have uh, a different philosophies in government right here in Washington. We have ones that believe that we should leave it up to the individual. We should have, let free enterprise system reign. Government should be small and it should be efficient. And then on the other hand, we have those that believe government is the answer. And I think we have to make some changes. Uh, next year, we, I'm uh, of course supportive of, of a Republican and think we need to have uh, more help in the Senate and the White House if we're going to get our fiscal house in order, if we're going to allow agriculture and other small businesses uh, to thrive, and if we're going to retain freedom for our individuals in this country. So now is the time to get involved and to, to find those candidates that share your views and values and get behind them and so that we can turn our country around. Make your voice heard in Washington and take a stand on issues that affect you and your operation. Become a member of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association by calling 1-866-USA-BEEF. You can also visit us online at our new and improved website, beefusa.org. Ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I was born and raised here and that's one of my goals. I would love to see my kids and the next generation have that I've seen. Beyond tradition, there's a wide spectrum of qualities that make this historic Maryland ranch unique. Plus, we'll introduce you to one dairy operation that's putting beef quality first. Stay with us. You're watching NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen on RFD TV. John Deere K-Series Loaders. You asked for a machine beefy enough to handle your harsh work environment, and John Deere delivered. Axle coolers, reversing fans, and a dual hydraulic differential lock keep your machine productive for years to come. And with dozens of options, this loader is king of the cattle business. Your dealer can spec a K-Series loader that's just right for you. See your dealer today. Draxon, clearly Cattlemen's number one choice to fight BRD. Here's why. Nothing is more depressing in a stalker business as the doctor and doctor. And you still have your chronics, you still have your death loss. And with Draxon, we just found out, that, especially with microplasts, you just had to be there to see the results. And the evidence backs up what most cattlemen already know. Draxon cuts chronics and mortalities by 70%. So talk to your veterinarian and check the online calculator at Draxon.com. You'll see, nothing gives you more for your money when you're fighting BRD. Just a great antibiotic. Very, very effective. Don't let the price tag scare you. It's a no-brainer. You just use it. Do not use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older. Do not use in calves to be processed for veal. Draxon has a pre-slaughter withdrawal time of 18 days. Please visit Draxon.com or call 1-888-DRAXON for more information. Quality matters to me because I love my family. 
I want to raise my family here like generations before me. My family has always worked together and played together. We have always laughed together and cried together. My family is my life. Careful stewardship of the animals and resources that are under my care benefits my family. They live where I work and eat the same food that I produce. I'm proud of what we'll do here today. Welcome back. NCBA's Environmental Stewardship Awards Program, or ESAP, is now in its 20th year. Regional and national winners have been chosen from across the country for their commitment to protecting the environment while operating profitable cattle operations. For the next few weeks, we're going to share the stories of this year's regional winners of the Environmental Stewardship Award. And we begin with Region 1 in eastern Pennsylvania. For more than a century, the Masonic Village at Elizabethtown has successfully combined a 1,400-acre crop and livestock operation with a full-service retirement community, owned and operated by the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. We are uh, basically a retirement and nursing facility uh, situated in southeastern Pennsylvania that operates a full-fledged farm from top to bottom. We manage about 600 acres of about which half of that is uh, dedicated to the cattle and we have a pretty intensive grazing operation and about half of that is dedicated to row crops. Our cattle operation has evolved uh, uh, over the years from a small beef cattle herd to a predominantly purebred shorthorn uh, herd of cattle. Uh, about half of our total of 150 cow-calf pairs is shorthorns, the other half is uh, made up of crossbred uh, shorthorns and black cattle. From the beginning, the goal of the Masonic Village has been to create an environmentally sound farming operation that can also be enjoyed by the residents. Our main calving pasture has a, uh, uh, a venue where uh, residents can uh, uh, come out, sit on a bench and watch a, a, a calf nursing mom uh, in the springtime. It's a very therapeutic, uh, very uh, relaxing situation for them. They asked all kinds of questions about the farm and we're more than happy to give them the information. It's where they live. They live here every day, and we try to take care of it. Masonic Village has partnered with a variety of groups to ensure their grasslands are managed in a sustainable way. They worked with NRCS to create a grazing plan to maximize production while conserving resources. Coming up with this plan was a challenge, since not all of the farm's pastures are located next to each other. We uh, designed a, a pattern of fencing that allowed us to not only graze those areas, but to utilize walkways and transfer points to be able to move cattle as a one-person option all the way across our farm enterprise. We've developed alleyways and temporary fencing to cross roads or go underneath bridges and different creek crossings to uh, move our cattle around that we can use all our ground. Masonic Village has been a pioneer when it comes to protecting water resources. They installed concrete, stabilized stream crossings to prevent erosion, and gave the creek a much needed facelift by removing a century's worth of sediment. This helped improve water quality and enhance wildlife habitat. Also, by fencing off streams and developing cattle watering systems, they have reduced soil erosion and runoff. We are very conscious of the fact that we are a tributary to the Susquehanna River, that then going just 70 miles to the south of us right into the Chesapeake Bay. It's important for us to be good stewards of our land and of our water. We've planned a spring collection system that pipes it through concrete water troughs to keep the cattle out of the creeks and uh, off the creek banks so that they have water in different places spread out that they're not all congregated at one spot for very long so it, it cuts down on soil compaction and erosion that way. Stewardship, care for the land, you know we're all in this fishbowl together. They do it very well here and it, they've shown that it can be profitable and it can be done correctly. Wildlife and birds are plentiful on the village's three freshwater ponds and residents also enjoy the vast gardens. In addition, the Masonic Village team operates a large farm market which includes beef produced on the farm. They also regularly open their gates to the public for field days and tours. 
they've done a really great job of letting uh, outside groups come in, uh, cattlemen's associations, uh, even feedlot uh, groups come in here to look at their operation and uh, see what they do from a cattle management standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, and also a uh, nutrient management standpoint. If I'm an urban dweller in America today, this is the neighbor that I would love to have. I think that um, there's so much of animal production story that you can see right here at Masonic Village, and the fact that they are so transparent, and you can see how food is produced today, is so vivid and clear, and uh, they, they do it all from, from pasture to plate. Over the past century, much has changed in the way Masonic Village operates. However, the high quality of care for the cattle and the land remains timeless. We as stewards of the property have a responsibility to hand over property to the next generation and those that follow uh, that is equal to or better than what we inherited. The one motto that I use is that we take blue sky and green grass and make red meat. And it works really, really well. And we want to tell that story and show that we can be environmentally friendly to the land and produce a product that is a useful protein to feed the world, really. During the recent Cattle Industry Summer Conference, Dr. Tom Field, NCBA's Executive Director of Producer Education, caught up with Dave Petty, a past ESAP winner and current member of the Program Selection Committee. We're here at the 2011 Summer Cattle Industry Meetings in Orlando, Florida. With me today is Dave Petty, cattleman from Iowa, who knows a little something about a very important program to the cattle industry, the Environmental Stewardship Awards Program. Dave, tell me about the value of this program to our industry. I'd sure be honored to do that. You know, the Environmental Stewardship Award Program recognizes a producer in an operation that values and takes care of the environment, improves it, while at the same time we are improving productivity and profitability of their operation. And any time that you can improve the environment, improve productivity, improve profitability, your operation will be sustainable. And, and it's a real key to success today is being sustainable. As we recognize producers, um, is it one producer or several from around the country through this awards program? This is really unique. We have seven regions across the country that's broken into topography. So we picked seven regional winners, which we have uh, just recently picked the 21st year regional winners. And then we end up selecting one national winner over overall. And this has given us a real pool of top operations and individuals to utilize over the years from every part of the country. So as the selection process unfolds, who actually makes the choices about who wins these awards? You know, that's a really valuable, the, the diversity of our selection committee. We have representative from EPA, we have representative from NRCS, we have a representative from Range Society, the National Range Society, we have Fish and Wildlife, we have um, two academians, one with a um, Degree with especially in engineering facilities and one thing or another. We have another one that specializes in production, and um, so we and as well as we have um, two producers on the committee. So I think the really valuable thing here is this is not a, a group of cattlemen selecting one of their buddies to win a top award. This is a diversified group. When when we go through this as a selection committee these operations have been groomed over with a fine-tooth comb and um, it's really an honor to be selected by such a diverse group and uh, brought forward and what we found over the years is each and every one of these groups let's say for example EPA they're proud to hang their hat on this operation because they were part of the process part of, of recognizing this outstanding unit. In addition to NCBA who are some of the other partners who make the ESAP program uh, available? A very, very important part of this is the sponsorship. Um, this program could not happen without the sponsorship. We have Dow AgriScience, which has been the lead sponsor of this for a long time. We have NRCS. Um, they've been a tremendous sponsor with us. We have Fish and Wildlife, as well as we have support from lots of other um, entities and organizations. But, but those are our main sponsorships, and without, without them, we could not finance this. 
Well, it takes a partnership, and certainly ESAP uh, gives us an opportunity to leverage the great work of cattlemen uh, across the country. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate your time and, and energy in this program. Thank you. Kevin, back to you. Thanks, Tom. Nominate your operation or someone you know for an ESAP award. Find out more at cattlemantocattlemen.org. And we'll be right back. It's a fact. You can't make money on open cows. Overlook some protozoa and they'll spread through your cows like <laughs> gossip at the Main Street Cafe. So stomp out trouble in advance. Give Trick Guard to your cows. It's the only vaccine that keeps trichomoniasis from messing up breeding season and lets you ring the register with every new calf. Go on now. Take care of your cattle. And they'll take care of you. Purina's wind and rain minerals are research tested and field proven to provide balanced mineral nutrition essential for cattle health, growth and reproduction. They're highly palatable so cattle consume what they need when they need it. And wind and rain mineral special formulation resists the elements so they won't blow out of the feeder and maintain their palatability even if they've been wet. Wind and rain cattle minerals from Purina Mills, building better cattle. fierce acceleration, the Gator XUV825i will shatter your expectations. Welcome back. Beef quality assurance. It's one important key to growing consumer demand for our products. And each year, two outstanding operations are recognized for their dedication to their animals. Let's learn more about one outstanding dairy. Laterra Livestock is a dairy and cow-calf operation based in Pennsylvania. The operation was founded by John and Judy Ligo. They founded it on the principles of respectful and humane treatment of their animals and good responsible land stewardship. That is why Pennsylvania Dairy Stakeholders, Pennsylvania Beef Council, and Vista Grand Farm all nominated Laterra Livestock for the 2011 National Dairy Beef Quality Assurance Award. Judy and I both had professional careers and we both left those careers to go to the farm. It's a chance for us to, to build and grow and have an expression of our own character and reap the benefits of our own labor and our own good decisions and, and stand by our bad decisions. But the mistakes have been few and far between at Laterra. They have seen substantial growth and now run a diversified operation. We added a dairy enterprise in 1990. We added registered Highland cattle in 1995, and we added commercial beef cattle in 2005. Our farm now consists of 1,100 acres owned and about 400 acres rented. We milk about 200 Holsteins year-round, and we raise all our replacement heifers. So with milking and dry cows, we have 230 Holsteins and about 185 replacement heifers. A few years ago, we recognized that some of the land that we were farming is rather marginal land, so now we have about 110 Angus and Angus cross cattle that we sell feeder calves from. John and Judy both firmly believe that they owe everything to the cattle themselves. That is why they have such a dynamic focus on the respectful treatment of their animals. I like the relationship to the cattle, I like spending time with them and socializing with cattle. We start with them when they're calves, even the dairy calves we start in individual hutches and they're handled at least twice daily with bottle feeding and bucket feeding. So we see those calves every day and they're well socialized. The beef cattle as well, we spend a lot of time with them and try to just walk among them and see them and be calm and quiet so that they're used to seeing people. When we do wean them, we do fence line weaning. From that point we're able to start graining the calves and again they're used to seeing us and they come around and they're easy to handle. John and Judy realized early on that the principles of the Beef Quality Assurance Program would be of great benefit to their operation. 
Dairy farms have a, a significant secondary income in beef and a large portion of beef comes from dairy farms and we need to be aware of the quality of that beef. There was a notice at the extension office that there would be beef quality assurance certification and we went to that training which was a real eye opener. The record keeping, judicious and proper use of antibiotics, observing withholding times, and at that point we started to pay more attention to the general handling of our cattle. John and Judy recognized that even after a cow reaches the end of its life, it can still be utilized to benefit the land. In order to avoid contaminating groundwater and to recycle these animals as quickly as possible, we've been able to compost. And if we use straw bedding, the heat seems to neutralize the proteins and it's a very, very quick way to dispose of a cow. And of course, the nutrients stay on the farm and they're available to spread. And for the last 10 years or so, that's, it's worked really well for us. At La Terra, they appreciate the harmony between the land and the animals. For one thing I really like about being in the farming business and being this close to a, a cattle operation is the chance to work with the natural systems. Having the land and the cattle, they seem to offset each other. Our production costs for our feed are quite low because we make excellent use of our manure taking care of the cattle and recycling the nutrients out to the fields and back into the feed yards and back into the fields again is a very sustainable practice. I think BQA fits into that because BQA increases the public's perception of a sustainable operation, which is critical to all of the industry. While John and Judy are proud to have won this award, they understand that the beef industry as a whole is a community and what is good for the community is good for all. If this award can do anything, if we can help inspire consumer confidence in the product across the industry, that's probably the biggest thing that can come from this award for us. Because of their steadfast commitment to the humane treatment of their animals and their responsible land stewardship, we are proud to present John and Judy Ligo of Laterra Farms with the 2011 National Dairy Beef Quality Assurance Award. For more on the Beef Quality Assurance Program, we're joined by Ryan Rupert, Senior Director of BQA. Welcome back to the show, Ryan. It's great to be here, Kevin. Well, first of all, just tell us a little bit about what the BQA program is as a whole. Beef Quality Assurance is the industry's uh, safety and quality assurance program, and it, it really is a way for us to guarantee that our customers, whether that's uh, as a cow-calf producer, the feed yard, or uh, as a feed yard, the packing plant, to tell them that we've done everything possible to do the right thing and to provide the best quality product. It also lets our consumer know that we really care about the product that we provide them on their, their table every day. You know, as I understand, uh, through an interview that I did with uh, Dr. Tom Field, you've got some interesting online options this year. Is that right? Yeah, the BQA program is continually looking for new ways to reach producers. and. Uh, there's about 40 states now that utilize an online training program and it's very comprehensive and it's a great way if you can't make it to a face-to-face -face meeting to to keep your BQA certification up to date or if you've never been BQA certified a great way to go out there and get your first certification before maybe next time going to a face-to-face -face meeting to get to get a little more hands-on approach. Well, let me ask you, for that person that's not BQA certified as an example, what would you tell them? Why is this so important? Well, first of all, uh, in this day and age, our consumer really wants to know how we're caring and uh, taking care of food safety issues you know, related to the animal. And as a farmer rancher, we're so far removed now from that consumer that lives in New York City or LA that this is the beef quality assurance program is a way for us to tell them you know have this contract with them that we really care we care about them we care about our animals we want to provide the safest the highest quality best product in the world to them and that we do it 365 days a year you know when i tell stories to consumers about uh, growing up in western nebraska and and spending all night uh, in february and march uh, out calving cows in the middle of a snowstorm, people really don't believe that we do that. And we've got to find a way to remind them that we do that. And beef quality assurance is a great way to do it. It's not just telling a story, it is actually having the, the training and the, the proof to back up what we do. 
Ryan, I know training programs like this are not inexpensive to develop and deliver. How is BQA funded? Well, BQA uh, has been around for almost 30 years now, and of the past 20, uh, it's been funded through the beef checkoff. And that way, we really have the ability to, to do the things that producers need in order to provide the best training out there. That's great. Well, thank you for all you've done and for making this so much more convenient for so many producers. We appreciate that. Thanks, Kevin. Learn more about the BQA program at cattlemantocattlemen.org. We'll be right back. I'd like a moment with you dairy men, and if you're watching this, I'll assume you're done milking, to talk about the Dairy Beef Quality Assurance Program. DBQA has been designed to reduce lameness, bruises, and impolite behavior in the dairy cows and calves and steers that you're going to market for beef. The point is to guarantee as best we can to your buyers and to the consumer that we know what we're doing, that we're treating our animals right, and that the meat they buy is safe and wholesome. Because every milk cow and dairy calf you sell is going to wind up on a plate someday, and we want to make sure that our consumers have a great dining experience, right? Dairy BQA helps furnish you with management tools and useful information to increase the value of the cattle you market. So I invite you all to check it out at dbqa.org. See what it takes to be involved in your state. Because, that's well, it's the right thing to do. Tough trailers built for tough country. Big Bend Trailers manufactures a different kind of trailer, one that's built to put up with the rough conditions found on the ranch. Rugged built using heavy gauge powder coated steel and a two x four rectangle tube frame. There's a one inch gap between the side and floor, so there's no place for water or manure to accumulate and rust. Big Bend Trailers are loaded with standard features, a lever action hitch, a three foot escape gate and a middle sorting gate, rhino lining along the front edges and a receiver hitch to tow another trailer, chute or other equipment. Tough and practical, that's Big Bend Trailers, designed and built by a working cattleman. You can rely on and trust Big Bend Trailers for their durability and convenient features. Reasonably priced for any rancher to afford. For a list of dealers and other design features, visit BigBendTrailers.com. Big Bend Trailers, built cattlemen tough. Welcome back. It's a farm with a rich American history, dating back to one of the first governors of Maryland. The Y. Angus Plantation on the state's eastern shore has hosted dignitaries and heads of state. And it's now home to a cowherd owned by the University of Maryland. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brian Baxter has more from Queenstown, Maryland. It goes back to uh, William Paca, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence for Maryland, actually lived at this site. The manor house that you see in the background is actually um, the foundation of where that house is located is the original Paca house. So there's a lot of rich history here uh, for Maryland as well as for the beef cattle industry. The Paca family began the Y Plantation back in 1765 before William, now buried on the site, was elected governor of Maryland. The plantation changed hands over the years and in the 1970s, the Houghton family donated the land to the Aspen Institute and the cattle to the University of Maryland. The operation is also well known for its role in the Middle East peace negotiations in the mid-90s. Yeah, this was uh, during the Middle East peace negotiations in the 90s under the Clinton administration. The Aspen Institute was housed both, both sides of the debate. And so for about a week or 10 days, we had actually President Clinton flew in and landed in front of our office and Madeleine Albright and others were here. So it, was, it really put uh, this place on the map from an from a international point of view. Today, the Y Plantation works in conjunction with the University of Maryland on both research and education. It's also home to a herd of black Angus cattle and a unique genetic base. Well, we were blessed to have a good base of genetics and milk producing, raising good calves on grass and bulls that are fertile. And that's what the industry is looking for and coming back to why. 
we were blessed when we came here to have a generous semen bank from back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So we pulled out some bulls that, which we've never seen. And we used them this year and um, to bring back some of the older breeding, what we think are nice functional bulls and cattle. We kind of key in on the maternal traits, uh, the sound functional female and producing it on a consistent basis. So we want a, a, a good top line, good feet and legs, and a good udder. We want her to breed every year. We want to have a good temperament and last a long time. Our oldest cow will turn 19 in June. And with a focus on genetics and longevity, it's not a surprise that the plantation has a successful sale each April. We have an annual sale uh, the first Saturday every April and we sell um, yearling bulls, uh, 10 cow-calf pairs, and five heifers. And that provides us the um, money for the day-to-day -day operation so we can manage the herd. And then we do research uh, with the USDA and the University of Maryland Animal Science Department. And we manage all that as one cohesive group. We got them from Florida to Montana to Texas and they're all doing very well where they're at and you're talking all totally different climates from to heat extremes to extreme cold and they are functional and good and the majority of these cow calves we take out like out to the Dakotas and Montana they'll do better out there than they do here because of the climate and they'll wean a better calf out there but the they want our genetics and that's what we're producing. We'll have more from Maryland when we return. Comprehensive, practical, powerful. Now's the time to put the power of DNA to work in your herd with the comprehensive Igenity Profile. The inside information from Igenity can help you make more confident replacement heifer and herd sire selection decisions, add marketability to your feeder cattle, make faster genetic progress, and more. The best time to get started is when you're already working cattle during branding, weaning, or bull soundness exam. Get started today. Visit Igenity.com or call 1-877-IGENITY to put the power of DNA to work in your herd. You take pride in the beef you raise. Countless hours invested to assure a safe and wholesome calf crop. Why trust that calf crop to just anyone? Experience the new Dinklage difference with a long history and reputation for outstanding performance and cattle care. We use a combination of cutting edge technologies and data driven decision making to establish our place as leaders in the cattle feeding industry. Allow Dinklage to be a part of your team in the quest to maximize your profits. With five locations to serve you in Wyoming, Nebraska, and Colorado. For more information on the new Dinklage difference, stop by one of our yards or visit us on the web at DinklageFeedYards.com. Welcome back. Let's return now to reporter Brian Baxter in Maryland at the Y. Angus Plantation. These days, the environment is a top concern for the Y Plantation. The Environmental Protection Agency is making changes to how the nearby Chesapeake Bay is regulated and maintained. The Y River is over to uh, my right, to your left. It's a major ester, a tributary of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, a lot of agriculture around the Y River, like in the Chesapeake Bay. So we're working with the ag community, including the animal sector, to develop practices that can keep their industries economically viable, but at the same time protect the Chesapeake Bay. This farm is a peninsula, so we have water on three sides. So we've established um, a 75-foot buffer all the way around, and we fenced off all our streams um, using best management practices. It's been a little challenging, but it hasn't been as hard as we thought. You know, the three things we look for with cattle are feed, shade, and water. And if you fence out these areas, uh, shade can become a little problem, but with a little thought, we can, we can get it done. 
This is such an environmentally sensitive area with, uh, with the bay, with the rockfish and the crabs, um, and we need to leave it better than we found it. And agriculture, right or wrong, gets a lot of the blame, and so we do as much as we can to, for conservation practices. Well, with me being a waterman too on the side, the bay was so polluted and with the practices that the farmers and we are doing here today, we're trying to reduce the nitrogen runoff and the phosphorus and all that. And with these buffer strips and the intest grazing, it cuts down on all that. And that way, the rockfish will come back, the crabs will come back, and the oyster population will come back. And that's, you know, I was born and raised here, and that's one of my goals. I would love to see my kids and the next generation have that I've seen. Well, my, my perceptive, perception of this is we can have an economically viable agriculture and we can address the issues related to the Chesapeake Bay uh, through good research, extension, and outreach. And Maryland farmers have done a magnificent job of implementing best management practices, including the beef and animal industry with buffers, having setbacks from our rivers and streams, keeping cattle uh, so they don't water in our rivers and streams. We provide waters, fence out sensitive areas, things of that nature, just sort of common sense things that are not really all that expensive but can have a huge impact on water quality. It's that focus on the future that's kept the Y Angus plantation in business through the centuries. A balance between cattle health, quality genetics, and caring for the environment is what these cattlemen hope both their fellow producers and beef consumers will recognize for years to come. As I say, going back to herd health, um, the more you vaccinate and the more you keep up to date on that, you will not have your sick animals, you'll have your production going up, and you'll not have no problems at all. And that's why we vaccinate four times a year. We worm, we put fly tags in. It takes a little time, but in the end, when those calves are weaned, you're getting more pounds at the end than if you're not doing it. They know what they're getting when they come here. They know their stability in the program, and they know that we always have the best interest in the cattlemen's that buy our animals to make sure that they have a profitable business themselves. It's a closed cycle. We're dependent on good people buying our animals, and the people who buy our animals are need the integrity and the reputation of our program so that they'll be interested in buying our Y cattle. In this area, one of our county agents did a study a few years ago, and within 200 miles of where we're standing, there's uh, about nine million people, and those nine million people have to eat. So we have to, we have to think, as our population keeps growing, how are we gonna feed all these people? And as it gets, we get more urbanization on the East Coast and West Coast, that kind of gets pushed into the middle. So we're not, while we're not Iowa or Illinois, we still make a significant contribution to, uh, to the food supply. Reporting from the Y Angus Plantation in Queenstown, Maryland, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. The Y Angus Plantation will host its 34th annual sale next April. You can get details on the operation by visiting our website at cattlemen to cattlemen org. We'll be right back. Education, networking, opportunity, and fun. That's what you'll find at the 2012 Cattle Industry Annual Convention and NCBA Trade Show in Nashville, Tennessee. Get your ticket to ride with your fellow cattlemen and women in the country music capital of the world. You'll find cutting-edge education, top-of-the-line technology, and entertainment that can't be beat. Don't miss your ticket to ride to the Cattle Industry Annual Convention and Trade Show in Nashville, Tennessee, February 1st through the 4th, 2012. For more information, visit beefusa.org. I am an NCBA member. I am an NCBA member. I'm an NCBA member because NCBA is our voice in Washington. I'm an NCBA member. I am an NCBA member because I feel it's important that we have 
uh, an association such as this in Washington, D.C. to support our cattlemen throughout the country. I am an NCBA member. Join me today. Let's face it, you don't think a lot about your trailer hitch. You use it and forget it. We understand, but at B&W, we think about it. Short nights, long hauls, never-ending chores, the unthinkable. We think about it all, so you don't have to. B&W, trusted. With the advent of third-party verification, cowmen are able to add value to their calves by preconditioning or early weaning or seek specialty markets like all-natural, sugar-free, or do source and age verification for export. Well, that's what IMI does, and it's not as expensive as you might think. Call them. What do you got to lose? IMI Global's Green Ear Tag. It's like having Honest Abe co-sign your note. IMIGlobal.com. The banker took his ledger out, the rancher took a seat. Let's see, I'll let you 20 thou for cattle, corn, and wheat. Let's talk about your cattle first. The rancher's face looked pained. You know how bad the market's been. I lost 15, he explained. 15 what? 15 cents a pound or 15 died of thirst? No, $15,000 lost. But hey, it could be worse because the hogs got sick and my son got drunk and joined the Moonies church and I figure I'm down 40 thou. But hey, it could be worse. What do you mean it could be worse? That ain't even funny. The rancher shrugged and then replied, could have been my money. The rancher sat across the desk applying for a loan. He'd never borrowed cash before. He'd made it on his own, but times were hard as he explained, and if they only could, he'd like to borrow 20 grand. Well, the banker understood. That doesn't sound unreasonable, although it's quite a lot. Your cows can be collateral. How many cows you got? 200 head, the rancher said. That's give or take a few. Well, that's enough, the banker said. Of course, there's interest too. In three months' time, the rancher came and paid the loan in full, but in his poke he had some left that was expendable. Why don't you leave that cash with me? The banker said, content. You put your money in my bank, I'll pay you 8%. The rancher paused. Now let me see. You gave me 20 grand, and then I paid you extra back for lending me a hand, and now I give you this pile of cash and you pay me this time the extra that I done forked out at slightly over prime. The banker nodded helpfully and lit himself a smoke. The rancher seemed to cogitate and then he finally spoke. Well, I ain't too good at high finance, but you put me on the spot. Fair is fair. So tell me, sir, how many cows you got? This is Baxter Black from out there. Thanks Baxter for that financial insight and we'll be right back. NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. It's a television show by cattlemen for cattlemen. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Thanks for joining us. Each week, join host Kevin Oxner for the latest in beef cattle news, market analysis, and producer education. Cattlemen won't want to miss an episode. Debuting Tuesdays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern on RFD-TV or anytime at cattlemen2cattlemen.org. Quality matters to me because I'm responsible for managing the natural resources under my care, providing clean water and healthy feed, and creating an environment that fosters new life. I care for mother cows and newborn calves, nurturing them through the beginning of the life cycle. The entire beef industry is relying on me to provide a quality product they can work with. This is the beginning of the American beef industry. I am proud of what we'll do here today.
Welcome back. This week's legacy photos come from that beautiful Pennsylvania farm you saw just a few minutes ago. Let's take a look. sending us those great photos. To do so, visit us at cattlemantocattlemen.org. Next week, we'll visit one of the country's largest and most innovative cattle feeders and find out how they tackle bovine respiratory disease, plus what consumers are thinking about buying beef these days, and a visit to a ranch in the Kansas Flint Hills. Thanks so much for joining us for this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll see you right back here next week on RFD. TV.